Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to our service this morning, and it's good to have you with us. And um, we're just going to open our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to worship you, our amazing, wonderful Creator God. Help us this morning to worship you with all our hearts. To set aside things of the past week and to focus our eyes on you. We thank you this morning that we come to a God who is above all. He's all seeing, all knowing, yet one who reaches down to meet us where we're at. You know what we're like, yet you still love us. And more than anything, we thank you for the amazing grace that you've shown to us. You sent your only son to die on the cross, to take our punishment, and that we can be forgiven. So Lord, this morning, may everything that happens here bring glory to you. We ask your blessing on Seamus as he brings your word. May the Holy Spirit be at work in our church this morning, moving from seat to seat, from heart to heart, bringing convictions of sin, correction, assurance, and help, and meeting us at the point of our need. And may we leave this morning knowing that we've heard from you and ready to do your will in the coming week. We ask all these things in your precious name. We're going to open our service this morning by singing, Come, now is the time to worship. Morning, everyone. Morning. Warm welcome to you. Good to, good to see you along. Uh, we trust you'll be blessed in our service today and also to those who join us online as well. Always forget the online folks, so uh, a, a warm welcome to you as well. A uh, couple of announcements for the incoming week. Tonight, half past seven, is our young people's ministry, high school age, alive. So they are meeting in the Hamilton Hall and looking at the topic this evening, who is king? So recognize God's rule and reign over us. Uh, tomorrow night, 8 p.m., bowling club in the Hamilton Hall. Then Tuesday in Brookfield, children's club. Uh, so children's club is for primary school aged children. And they have a, a, a Bible lessons and singing and quizzes and games 
and lots of fun as they learn uh, God's Word. So all children from both churches are very welcome to that. Uh, no midweek here, but on Thursday night we have a special uh, choir coming to visit us from Africa, Eswatini, uh, called the Hope and Glory Ladies Choir. So it's a group of ladies that uh, are touring the province and uh, we're very privileged to have them. And each of them tell their story. They've been brought out of a very difficult life situation. Um, and they also sing as well. So this, this place will be uh, transformed. So all welcome to that. Admission is free. There'll be a cup of tea after the service. We'll be lifting an offering to support them as well. So keep that in your diary. So that's Thursday evening at half past seven. Hope and ladies, hope and glory, ladies choir. Uh, hope to show a little bit, uh, show a video later on during the children's address about that. Friday morning, half, half past nine, Little Islanders in the Hamilton Hall, uh, and then Friday, seven p.m., Youth Club in the Church Hall in Brookfield, and that's also for children of primary school age. Uh, I was given a leaflet, it's that time of year again, Samaritan's uh, Purse Shoebox, Christmas Shoebox Appeal. So uh, please, can you consider filling out a shoebox for this year? I'm not sure when it's to be handed in, but it's not that soon. 12th of November, there we go, thank you. I think that's all our announcements. Uh, let me bring us to the first of two readings. It's a long chapter, chapter 41 of Genesis. We'll do part of it now and part of it later. Uh, Joseph is in prison, but as we'll hear in this chapter, not for much longer. We'll pick up the story in verse 1, chapter uh, Genesis 41. This is God's word. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the river bank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the sleek seven fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin, scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a uh, servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream, and things turned out exactly as he had interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. Uh, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh shared the dreams with them. We'll not repeat them again, the seven cows uh, and the seven heads of grain being cannibalized by the seven ugly cows and the, uh, and the windswept uh, uh, grain. We'll move on to the interpretation. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. Uh, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. 
It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance of Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And now, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest in Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. Amen. We'll unpick that, we trust, a little bit later on. Boys and girls, can I see you down the front? Now, good to see you. Any others coming from stairs? Yep, here comes Ruby. And another Ruby. Oh, lots and lots coming. Good to see you all. Now, I have a couple of birthdays. So, uh, where is Logan Hanna? When was it your birthday? Three days ago. Oh, you're three. Sorry, you're three. That's right. You're, you're. So I have. No, he's three. He's not two. You're bigger than two. He's three. He used to be two, but now he's three. So, Logan, I've got you the God Contest coloring and activity book. Do you think you'd be able to do that? Well done. So, who else? Ruby. What age are you? Nine, come on up here and everybody sees you. Unbelievable, nine years of age. So how's the reading? Good, I think you could read that. Gladys Aylward. You wanna read, we have to wait to your birthday. <laughs> Where's Harley? Come on over Harley. Harley is 11 years old. Do you know Harley was the first child I baptized? I baptized you. Do you remember that? No. No, you don't. <laughs> and now you're big. Have you got this? No. You don't think so? I don't think you have. So that's your The Pilgrim's Progress. So you can read that. It's one of the most famous stories ever. Reading good? Good man. Good. Thanks for singing this morning. <clears throat> and uh, also little Ellen uh, is one today. Is it today? Yes, so happy birthday, Ellen, uh, and, and also Thomas Bell is 18, or was 18 last week. Thomas, give us a wave. Stand up there and give us a wave. He's not standing up. <laughs> He's too shy. Happy birthday, Thomas. Right, boys and girls, we have been following the story of Joseph in the Bible, and Joseph has an amazing story. And today, he's been in prison. Did we know that? But today is the day he gets out of prison. And not only that, but he's brought to a palace. And he is uh, allowed to meet the king. And the king gives him new clothes and jewellery. And he gives him a new job. In fact, the best job ever in all of the country is given to Joseph. And not only that, boys and girls, but he gets married to a beautiful girl and then down the line has two boys. So do you think that was all a dream? Could that really happen? Do you think it was a dream? It didn't really happen. That somebody could 
come from prison and be a prince? The boys and girls, it did happen. And it happened not just to Joseph way back then, but it happens all the time to people who put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. I'm going to show us a short video of the ladies. Some of you may have seen this on Facebook, but uh, these ladies all come from a really difficult life and their lives have been transformed by Jesus. And it's, it's just one and a half minutes long. We'll play it now and we'll hear this. In October and November, our Hope and Glory Ladies Choir are touring the UK and Northern Ireland, singing, dancing, and sharing their all inspiring and life-changing testimonies of how God has touched and changed their lives, instilling hope and excitement in their audiences. We would love for you to experience this incredible event and learn of how God is using Challenge Ministries Swaziland to help the people of our beautiful homeland, the Kingdom of Eswatini, as we tackle high levels of unemployment, domestic abuse, teenage pregnancy, and political unrest. Join us for an uplifting and joyful time of praise, worship, and inspiring testimonies as we celebrate the work that God is doing in beautiful Eswatini. The Hope and Glory Choir from the beautiful Kingdom of Eswatini is super excited to come to your nation. We are going to spend time just sharing about God's love, grace, and hope through song and power of testimony. Hope to see you there. Coming on Thursday night, now, not sure if it's really suitable for children, but it's definitely suitable for big people. And uh, and here's the point I want to make. God doesn't just change the lives of people in the Bible long ago or people who live far away in Africa. He changes lives today. I'm sure if we ask many people around this church, has God changed your life? They would say, yes, God has changed my life. And boys and girls, you're little and you've yet to grow up. But God has a plan for you, each one of you. And that plan is to bless you and to change your life. And as we put our trust in the Lord Jesus and walk with him every day, then he will bring that plan to pass little bit by little bit. Even though at times, like Joseph, it doesn't seem like it's coming to pass, that God will bring it to pass because he's a good God and he's powerful enough to be able to do it. So let's pause a moment and give him thanks for that. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have our lives in your hands. Indeed, you have the whole world in your hands. Lord, you love us and you care for us and you're powerful enough and big enough to change our lives transform us from where we are and even what we are into something that we could never have got by ourselves. Lord, bless our boys and girls and may they grow up always trusting you as their Lord and Savior. We pray in Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen. Now we're going to sing that lovely children's hymn, He's Got the Whole Wide World in His Hands and we'll stand the same.
on with these. You can all talk among yourselves. <laughs> now, take two. Ruby, you're allowed to take three because it's your birthday. Now. Two. Well done. Now, you can all go to Children's Church. Every day we are witnessing the harrowing scenes of the war that's been happening in the Middle East um, and with the number of people being killed and injured rising all the time. Our moderator has written to each minister within the church and asked uh, their ministers to lead our people in prayer this week and next week for this unfolding uh, crisis. So we'll do that now as we pray. Lord Jesus, we would ask you this morning to intervene by your sovereign grace of mercy and bring an end to the conflict and the safe release and return of hostages. We pray for peacemakers to be raised up and the leaders of communities and nations brought together in negotiation. We ask that the grieving and heartbroken would know God's comfort, that the traumatized and injured would receive timely medical treatment and support. We pray for humanitarian relief to reach the displaced and most vulnerable, many who have lost everything, that they would know God's protection and provision. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. We thank you too for our own church, Lord God, and for the needs that are here. And we commit them into your care. We ask you, Lord, we thank you that you invite us to come before the throne of grace and to bring our prayers and petitions to you because you care for us, you love us. And we're reminded that we're coming to a good God and a powerful God. So bless our congregation, we pray. We pray too for and give thanks for the offering that has been given. And pray as we pray every week that it would be used wisely and well for your glory in this place and further afield that your kingdom might grow. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our uh, third piece, Whatever My God Ordains is Right.
Lovely. Um, so Joseph is out of prison. He's in the palace. He's just interpreted the dreams. And he has explained the plan or uh, offered a plan to Pharaoh. Let's pick up the reading in Genesis 41, verse 37. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your order. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of uh, fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command and people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all Egypt. And Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Sapinath Pania, and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of own, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the whole land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years of age, 30 years old, when he entered the, the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by a senath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, because the famine was severe everywhere. What a story. What a, an amazing story. I wonder if you ever had a day when everything changed for you. Uh, by the end of the day, everything was completely different to how it started out. Perhaps it was the day that you got married. That morning you were single, and that evening you were Mrs. Somebody or Mr. Somebody. Or maybe it was when you moved home. That morning you got up in your bed, and, uh, that, uh, and uh, that evening you went to bed in a different bed, in a different house, in a different location. Everything changed. And sometimes changes are like that in our lives. They're very dramatic. They're sudden. They're instant. Uh, our life alters, and it's never the same again. Well, Genesis 41 gives us such a day for Joseph. I guess it began like any other day. Uh, he's up early, he's serving, he's helping in the prison, he's reporting to the warden. Uh, he's working there for the warden, but he's also a prisoner there. And if you've been following the series, or if you've, uh, if you've read these chapters, you know that Joseph, for a crime he didn't commit, has been incarcerated in this prison for up to as much as 10 years at this stage. And so you could say that he's been pretty much forgotten about. No one really knows he's there anymore. His family don't know he's there. His father thinks he's dead. Uh, Potiphar, who put him there, has long ago pushed Joseph to the back of his mind. A previous prisoner, the 
king's cupbearer whom he interpreted a dream for, someone he'd helped a couple of years ago, has long since moved on. Nobody cares about Joseph anymore. They've locked the door and thrown away the key. But Joseph's God has not forgotten Joseph. Joseph's God does care. Because this man's imprisonment has all been part of a plan that all, the Almighty God of heaven and earth has been working to. And today is the day when that plan gets revealed. And folks, as we hear this chapter taught, I pray that it will show us at least two wonderful truths about God. One, that God is powerful. Powerful enough to be in control of all things. Not just what happens to us in our individual lives, but what happens across the world, just as it, he was powerful enough to be across everything that the famine would bring in the known world at the time. And as we think about our lives, and as we also think about our world at this time, the world is in chaos, isn't it? I want us to remember from this chapter that he truly has our lives in his hand, but the whole world in his hands. And the second thing I want us to see is that God truly is a good God. Everything that God does is good. Even the painful things that he allows in our lives, God can work for good. Even the sinful things that we do in our lives, God can change for good. So two points. God is powerful. God is good. Let's get back to the chapter and allow me to tell the story a little bit. It's night time. Uh, while Joseph is sleeping in prison, uh, Pharaoh is asleep in the palace. It's then, perhaps in the wee hours of the morning, that God initiates his master plan for Joseph personally, but also for the whole world or the known world at that time. He speaks to the king as he slumbers on his bed. Pharaoh dreams two very disturbing dreams. He wakens after the first only to fall asleep again and dream the second. They're both very similar. Uh, seven fat and healthy cows cannibalized by seven gaunt and ugly cows. Then seven uh, good and healthy uh, heads of grain cannibalized by seven withered and wind scorched heads of grain. He has no idea what the dreams meant, nor had anybody else in all of Egypt. The best of his advisors didn't have a clue. No one in Egypt has a clue what's going on in Pharaoh's dreams. And, you know, thinking about this, uh, given the position that Pharaoh had and his advisors had, the average Egyptian would be forgiven for thinking, well, they ought to have known. You see, uh, Pharaoh was considered to be a god. He was worshipped in Egypt. And if you're a god, well, you should be all over a little dream. You should know what that means. But this god was stumped, hadn't a clue. And so were all his advisors. And that's when the conversation turned to Joseph. You know, little did Joseph know that he had become the intense topic of conversation among the most important people of the nation. People were talking about him while he was working that morning in the prison. It was his old prison con, the butler, who brought his name up. Here, let me just remind us again what, what, uh, what he said. Today I'm reminded of my shortcomings, he says. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us, he says, had a dream that same night and each dream had a meaning of his own. Now, a young Hebrew slave was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position. The other man was impaled. Without hesitation, Pharaoh says, send for this man. Straight away, get him here. That was it. That was the day that Joseph's life changed. He moved house. Never again would he sleep on that filthy prison floor. Never again would he eat that horrible prison food. 
Never again would he look out of the sky through those prison bars. This man's, young man's life was about to be radically, dramatically different. He was given a hasty shower and a shave. Egyptians didn't like beards, uh, I've read. And he was given a clean change of clothes. And so he, imagine him most likely flanked between two Egyptian guards, was brought right into Pharaoh's throne room. This was the Oval Office. This was 10 Downing Street with the whole cabinet there uh, that he was in front of. Anyone, everyone who was anyone was there. And every eye was focused on Joseph. Butler was there probably looking a tad guilty as well. Pharaoh spoke. I had a dream, he said. And nobody can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Pause there a moment. Before we think about Joseph's answer, let's think about him. How might the 17-year-old Joseph have answered that question? Now, he's not 17 anymore. He's 30. It would probably have been, yes, Pharaoh, you're right. I, I can interpret dreams. I'm good at that. I do it all the time. This is your lucky day, Pharaoh. You tell me your dream, and I will tell you what it means. It's probably how a 17-year-old full of himself, Joseph, would have answered that question. And also, the 30-year-old Joseph would have been very tempted to think, very mindful that this is probably his golden ticket out of prison. Tell this man what he wants to hear, make it convincing, and you're free. Joseph doesn't yield to that temptation. And Joseph is no longer 17, he's 30. And those 13 years of God's work in his life means that he is no longer the man that he used to be. He's older, wiser, he's humbler. This man's faith in God has matured, grown into a deep godliness. And his answer is not about himself. At one time his world was all about himself. But his answer in that setting and before those important people is absolutely incredible. And when I thought about his answer, I thought I would long for my own heart to have the same level of humility that we see in this man's answer impoverished but for God. Here's what he said. I cannot do it. Can't do it. Can't do what you're asking me to do. The Hebrew language has this phrase really as a single word of deprecation in which we have to use a phrase to explain it. It's literally what Joseph was saying, it's not in me. <laughs> I don't have it in me to give you the answer, Pharaoh. And, you know, if, if, folks, I don't want us to go past this point. You know, that response in that setting displays the very first beatitude that Jesus taught us we're blessed to have. Blessed is the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit is to know that without God, you can do nothing. And that's what Potiphar's house and the prison cell had taught Joseph. Without God, I just can't do it. And also the reverse of that is true. With God, all things are possible. That's the response he gave to Pharaoh. He says, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And I imagine the court listening to this, thinking, right, that's interesting. He says he can't do it, but his God can, and Pharaoh's a God, and he can't. And so immediately, 
when he has put Pharaoh in a place of subservience to Israel's God. Pharaoh is the Egyptian God, cannot interpret the dream, but here's Joseph saying, Israel's God can. Right, we'll see. And so Pharaoh proceeded to explain his dreams to the young slave. And after he had done so, Joseph, without hesitation, not only interpreted the dream, seven bumper years followed by seven famine years, but proceeded to give advice on what to do next. Appoint a man over it. Now, he wasn't promoting himself. It was just good advice. Little grain silos store 20% of the harvest and use that in the seven famine years. That's what you should do, Pharaoh. And his interpretation of the dream and wise advice fell upon the ears listening in that room like all wise and timely advice does. It sounded right. It made total sense. And I could just imagine heads nodding right around the room. Chief amongst those was Pharaoh's. He was really impressed. Can we find anybody like this man, he said, this is the man. And there and then he blessed him with valuable possessions and great authority. And all of a sudden, Joseph was second in command of Egypt. And adding to that, he gave him a wife, he gave him two sons. I mean, what a day. From the pit to the palace, from prison clothes to designer clothes. From a nobody to everybody knowing his name. Joseph was the most talked about person in all the country. And he would continue to be because his policies would make the difference between starvation and salvation. He would save many, many lives. He'd be busy, he'd travel a lot, he'd go from city to city, overseeing the grain storage. And when the famine came, he would be administering the grain distribution, selling it, not just to the Egyptian people, but to uh, international travelers who came to buy grain. Verse 57 says this, And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. Books chapter, chapter 41 of Genesis allows us to see, as I said earlier, two things. That God is powerful and God is good. And in this chapter, we see him exercise that power with perfect timing, both to Joseph's life as an individual and to the nation's life in crisis. It was God's power that took Joseph from the prison and God's power that raised Joseph to prominence. He couldn't have done that for himself. It was God who delivered him. God who helped him. And it was God's power that prevented national starvation. And Egypt, with all their gods and all their cleverness, didn't have the answer to that. They couldn't figure that one out. And God was able to bring these two incredible saving acts for the individual, for the nation, together in a unified act of a sovereign plan for the world. Folks, here's what's true about Almighty God. He presides over us and he presides over this whole world with absolute sovereign power. Here's what Paul taught in Romans. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. I want us to remember that, that God is powerful. I also want us to remember that God is good. Joseph's story reveals a good God. Do you know, had the story ended back in chapter 40 when I spoke a couple of weeks ago, we'd have been tempted to say, you know, God, you're unfair. You're unjust. Allowing such suffering to happen to a young man, 
He's really done little, if anything, wrong in life. I mean, what's that all about? But Joseph's story doesn't end there. And neither do I suggest to ours. God blessed Joseph with much in life. Actually, far and away more than he could ever have gained himself. Do you know, if Joseph had remained in Canaan, not went to Egypt at all, he'd always have been the younger brother and the most disliked brother. He'd always have lived under that. He'd have spent his whole life rearing just a few sheep in that, uh, in that country and would never have known his name. You can be sure of this, that no musical would ever have been written about him. And we wouldn't be talking about him today. God was good to him. And it, it was only as he looked back on his life that he could see that. And it's only when we look back on our lives that we can see God's goodness to us. It's a good God. Later to his brothers, he would be able to say this. We haven't come to this part yet, but he'd tell his brothers, he says, what you did to me, you meant for evil, but God meant it for good. And when his children were born to honor the goodness of God, he named both of them with names that expressed this aspect of God's character, his goodness. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So we see a good God act in the life of Joseph. And we also see a good God act in the life of the nation. God acted before the famine would come to provide for those people during the famine. And so he saved lives. He preserved families. He he would preserve the uh, Abrahamic line through which the Messiah would come. Folks, God is good. And we can lose sight of that when we are going through bad things. I think the goodness of God is the lens that we need to look through as individuals when there is a struggle in our lives for whatever reason. Here's the most chosen hymn at a funeral. Are we weak or heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? We take that to the Lord in prayer. We take that to the Lord of power and goodness. And so can I ask you this morning, do you feel, are you going through a bad time? Do you feel trapped where you are? Vulnerable where you are? Forgotten about where you are? It's not the whole story. It's not the plan that God has got for you. He does allow difficulties and stresses and pressures and strains to come into our lives, but that does not mean he is not a good God. He is a good God. That's what this chapter of the story tells us. It reminds us that there is a God who has remembered the soul that everybody else has forgotten about. He knows where they are and knows what's going on in their lives and he still has a plan. And I think that's the lens that we need to look through for the whole of life, for our lives. And can I suggest this, just in the, cu- just in the current day events, I think it's also the lens that we need to look through when reading current day events in the world. And all this going on in our world. I mean, chaos in the Middle East. Where's the goodness of God there? And the power of God there? And the famines and the earthquakes and the natural disasters and the growing climate crisis. I mean, where is God? 
One could just look at the world and say, well, you know, things are careering out of control. What's, where's God in all that? Is God even there? Is he not powerful enough to, to do something about this? And, and, I'm, and I'm sure over those seven years of famine, there were people who looked to the heavens and say, what's going on here? I can't even feed my family. But we see it when we read Genesis chapter 41. A God of power and a God of love acting before it happened to preserve lives. We get to see that. And when we read Matthew chapter 24 and the book of Revelation and many other parts of Scripture, we get to read that what's going on in our world the upheaval and the chaos and the war and the famine and the hunger, that that too is a God who is working to a plan for this whole world. The Bible tells us that these current day events are simply signs of his coming. Coming, the second coming of Christ. These things must happen before the coming of the Son of Man. And we get to read that. We get to know and put our trust in a God who knows what he's doing. And instead of looking around at the events and despairing and losing faith, we are told to look up and continue to be faithful to him and prayerful and wait on him. Folks, Genesis 41. I want us to see that God is both powerful on an individual level and on a national, global level and good. He is a good God. His power and his rule is worked out on little lives and whole nations. And he calls us to walk by faith in that. And you know, I'll finish with this. You want that encapsulated in a single truth. We see it in Jesus. Jesus was God's plan. He entered the world to save the world. And as Jesus hung on the cross, there was nobody there who really understood what was going on. There were people who were laughing and jeering. There were people who were grieving and upset. And nobody really understood. But God understood. That was his plan. The cross is both the wisdom and the power to save the world. And so in that way, this little story of Joseph points us to the big story of Jesus. A man raised from the prison to save the world. A man raised from the dead to provide eternal salvation for the world. The cross is God's wisdom and power at its greatest level. And we can put our faith in that kind of a God. Let's pray. Father, what our natural eyes cannot see, what our natural ears cannot at times hear, help us to walk by faith. Whether it's through difficulties in our own life, testing and trying times, or whether it's just switching on our news at night and listening to all that's going on. Help us to turn our eyes to the King of Kings, to the Majesty, to the Lord of heaven and earth, and to our Lord. And help us to put our trust in Him. May each of us this week and the week ahead walk by faith in this world. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
sing our closing hymn, uh, King of Kings, Majesty. And so we ask that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.